Hello. Welcome to Books and Brews. The place where beer and literature meet. With your host, certified Cicerone, Michael Agnew. And Laura Mosica, author of The Blue Bells Chronicles. Each month we invite a guest author to read their words and talk about writing while sipping beers specially paired with their work. This month we welcome Christine Hewson. So sit back. Pop a cold one. And dive into some books. And brews. We are fading in. The fading is complete and we are ready to go. So, welcome everybody to episode, this is 30, right? Number 30, the big yes. three. So last month we screwed up and said it was 28, but it was actually 29. Uh, So this is number 30. Welcome everybody to number 30 of Books and Brews podcast. Uh, So Laura, how's your weekend? How's your weekend? How's your weekend? (laughs) (laughs) Well, as you know, we had a pretty big move and um, that was very interesting. Um, The movers did a fantastic job moving us out because as our listeners know we have a lot of stuff. We've got like, I don't know, 75 musical instruments, if not more. We've got probably 5,000 books. We've probably got a thousand or more books of music. They did a great job getting us out in one day, but we got here and uh, things like the piano bolts were missing, so they couldn't put our pianos together. So that was, that was interesting. Um, I But, you know, we're getting settled in. We've got this beautiful pond outside with um, two uh, unicorns looking out through the grass. So it's a really neat place. You know, my dog can run free again. And we're bit by bit getting unpacked. And I'm now getting ready for two of my kids getting married within two weeks of each other. So nice. lots of stuff going on here. Uh, pretty good. We did our uh, fall tour, uh, Fast and Furious. Um, that went really great. It was lovely to be live again instead of do, trying to do highly interactive shows via Zoom. Um, were, were any of them in? No, year? they were all live. Everybody wanted live and in person because everybody knows how lousy it is doing these kinds of things on Zoom. Um, mm-hmm. So the shows worked how they're supposed to work. Uh, so far, all of the reviews have been glowing. Uh, so both of my crews did smashing, smash up, bang up jobs. Uh, we pissed some people off. We got some people talking. Uh-huh. It's all good. Well, and how's your banjo going? Banjo is going great. Uh, Masako said that I am getting better, that it sounds like I'm playing. Um, <laughs> I've got... Uh, the lessons are going really well. Although during tour, I didn't have my playing was opportunities were really sporadic. So the material for this uh, coming lesson on Wednesday is uh, not as good as it could be. But, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Were you in the with you? No, because we flew everywhere. What have you read this week, this month? I've not read anything. I've been too busy traveling and, and stuff. <laughs> Well, I got you covered again. Um, I restarted my uh, program, Step Into a Story, that I had tried to start, oh, I don't know, a year ago, and life got in the way. And so I've been doing a lot of reading. I read The Amber Crane by Malva von Hassel, and I read Where the Stork Flies by Linda Wisniewski. And they are both, they're, they'd be very appropriate for young adults, but they're enjoyable mm-hmm. for adults, too, and they're time travel stories. So um, I'm trying to think who I'm interviewing next week. I don't remember, but I'll, I'll be, oh, I do remember. Um, so I will be reading a story, um, more of a memoir about growing up with the military colonel as a father. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Uh, who's our guest today? Well, um, I'm going to have to have our guest say her last name. <laughs> Christine, how do you pronounce your last name? Yep, it's Houston. Husum. Husum. Did I get that right? Husum. Uh, yep. Husum. Husum. I think maybe the two Norwegian pronunciation would be Husum, but okay. but it's more Husum. Okay. I got Americanized. Right. <laughs> Christine Husum is a national best-selling author from Minnesota. She pens the suspenseful Winnebago County Mysteries and the cozy 
but not too cozy snow globe shop mysteries where bad guys demonstrate not everyone is Minnesota nice. We might have to explain that to our listeners. She also has stories in many anthologies and co-edited one. Hewsome served with Wright County Sheriff, is a member of Mystery Writers of America and Sisters in Crime, and is active with the Twin Cities chapter. She loves meeting readers at a variety of events and venues. And so I think welcome, Christine. We'll welcome. jump into our first beer. All right. Uh, so our first beer is so I gotta say this this was paired for a couple of reasons. One, because I found a tie into the reading, but also because it, it's a personal thing that it's end of September, beginning of October, and so that means it's Oktoberfest season. And Merits and Lagers are among my favorite beer styles, and this is the only time you can get them, so I drink a ton of them. So this is from Indeed Brewing Company in Minneapolis. This is their Oktoberfest Merzen. Uh, you'll love this, Laura, I think. Uh, so the Merzen style is uh, malty. It's, it's not caramel, but it can be described as kind of caramely. The, the bitterness is low. The hop character is low and a little bit spicy. They're just really good beers, and I love to drink them. Um, the reason I picked this one to pair to this particular first reading is, and, and Christine, I could be completely wrong about this. Um, sometimes as I'm reading something, I imagine where we are or when we are or something. It's just how it hits me. And I was imagining in the forest in early to late fall. So the air is a little crisp, but it's not yet cold. Uh, the forest floor is covered with with brown and orange leaves. In my imagination, the leaves are already off the trees, so you wouldn't be drinking Oktoberfest anymore, but what the heck, it's fall. <laughs> We're gonna drink Oktoberfest. <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's a pairing based on time and place. So cheers, Lauren. Cheers. And it sounds delicious. I'm, I'm not sure if I can drink it until halfway through her reading because... Uh, oh, no. sure you can. Just take a sip. <laughs> you have a little foam mustache. It's all good. You have a foam mustache. Okay. Mm, can you see my foam mustache? Not quite. Uh, yep. <laughs> that, I do like that. Yeah, these are... I just love Oktoberfest lager. <laughs> I, um, I love, now, why is it, is it the light in your house? Yours looks like a totally different color from mine. It's just the way the light is shining through yours, yeah. and I have a wider glass, so you've got more, okay. more okay. Uh, beer for the light to go through. But you had me sold on this just from the description, and I do like it. Yeah, I figured you would. Um, I like all the beers today. I think. What? I think you'll like all the beers today. I can't wait. All uh, right, oh. so first reading. Go ahead, Christine. All right, my first reading comes from Daphne Lionel's Woods, which is the fifth book in the Winnebago County Mysteries. And actually, a it's a little later in fall, a deer hunter has um, found a body in his woods when he's returning from his deer hunt. And so the sheriff's office is called out, and actually Sergeant Prin Corky Allison has been has been, been on trying to take herself off the road after a critical incident. And so this incident focuses her back into the into um, the on the road. Midwest Medical Examiner's van turned onto the field road in Phoenix Woods to where our mobile crime van sat and stopped. A short, stocky woman with gray hair looped into a spiky do got out and walked toward us with deliberate step. Friday Patrick, she announced. Her small, brown, not quite beady eyes narrowed in on smoke. She talked about Dr. Patrick, thanks for making me up here so fast, she said. Dr. Patrick pulled on protective gloves and leaned down and touched the inside of Miss Joe's wrist. She was full of Lionel. 
Her initial examination was quick as she ran her hands over the body, searching for obvious signs of what had caused her death. Her hands stopped the low middle back section. There's something underneath her. Could be a large knife or a sensor tool. Let's turn it over. Detectives Amanda Dubinsky and Vince Weber carefully slid their hand under this her shoulder and hip and rolled her on rubber phone three. What the heck? She was laying in the side of the ground, Weber said. Smoke and I took a step closer. The ground is disturbed under the leaves, he said. She was digging something, I said. Do you need the deceased here while you conduct the rest of your investigation, detective? She's been out here alone for two days by my estimation. I'd like to take her to the office, Patrick said. No, we've got what we need. I'll help you with the gurney. He followed Dr. Patrick to her vehicle. I don't want to know how uncomfortable that was for her laying on that thing, Weber said. I stared at Miss Doe's face again, but her blank expression hinted at nothing. Something went terribly wrong here. Smoke and Bridie Patrick rolled the gurney to about four feet from Miss Doe's body. Patrick unzipped the bag and Mandy said, we'll get her, we'll get her for you. She can't weigh 80 pounds, and she nodded at Weber. Miss Doe did not protest and picked her up and made her in the I love it when you make up words, statement. small shovel. What are we here? He bent over for a closer look and pushed a few leaves aside. She buried something there? I leaned in myself. The disturbed area on the floor of the woods was about 12 inches by 18 inches. The dirt appeared to have been dug out and put back and patted down. Curious, Sabinsky said, and curiouser, Weber said. And I didn't make that up. It came from something I read as a kid. You read Alice in Wonderland? Sabinsky's eyebrows squeezed together. I don't know, maybe, he mumbled and hitched his shoulder up. Let's see what might be in this rabbit hole, Smoke said. After he dug a, dug a little trench around the perimeter, he knelt down and started brushing away some dirt from the surface. There's something here. Mandy, Vince, and I lean in even closer, growing curiouser by the second. Smoke used a shovel to scrape thin layers of dirt from the site. I got it. He uncovered a gallon-sized plastic bag and lifted it from his burial plot, shaking off a bit of the soil that clung to it. What the heck, Weber said. There are bags of money inside, Dubinsky said. Smoke reached in and withdrew one sandwich-sized baggie after the next, then handed them to Dubinsky. Altogether, there were nine bags of varying thicknesses, depending on the stack of bills in each one of them. On the bottom of the gallon bag was a single photo in its own baggie. Smoke studied the photo for a long moment. I'm thinking it's our Miss Doe, but she has a whole lot more tissue and muscle on the bottom. And she's with two little kids. Put the bag over and rebel is written on the back. Looks like I'm guessing that's what I told the picture of it. What does it mean to hand the photo over? So strong that this means to you? Our third in here thought maybe Miss Doe was a member of the Swiss Apostolic Clan in Kodoko. Are those the ones with those kind of drab colored dresses that have those head coverings? Oh, I thought we had a little group of Amish around here somewhere, but never asked nobody about it. I think they're mostly together in Minnesota around Harmony, he said. Peace loving people that they are, they must have picked that town for its name, Robert said. I admired, he said, in this picture. She asked woman holding a toddler, another little one on her side, all the feet behind them in the distance. Kids have regular clothes on. The woman looks kind of old fashioned in that dress again, she said. Old as old she is, Robert asked. 25, maybe younger, she said. Three well, can't be too. Maybe four, five. A little bit of sadness pulled over me. Happy. It would have been nice if she had put a year on a 
give us an idea how all the kids are to be born. It's a puzzle, all right. We still got the question of why should we really hold the money? Well done. Uh, you know, first, I had a question. When I was reading on your website about your books, I got the impression that the setting was Wright County. Yes. Yep. So why are they called Winnebago County Mysteries? Because um, I had to give it a fictional name to protect the guilty in Wright County. So I used to, I worked for the Wright County Sheriff's Office, and I didn't want to use that name. But I got the name because Buffalo is the county seat. And Buffalo was originally known as Winnebago Village because we had really? Winnebago Indians that camped on Buffalo Lake. And we are the ones that named it the lake for the buffalo fish in it. And then okay. it became um, the village of Buffalo and then the city of Buffalo. But I also had uncles that lived in Winnebago County, Iowa. So it just seemed like a, a natural name for it. Okay, yeah, that really threw me because I was sure that I had read it sent Wright County and like, well, so Winnebago County is quite a ways south. What was your position in the Wright County Sheriff's Department? I worked in the jail as a corrections officer and then I went back to the Okay, so how did you get from the Sheriff's Office to writing? Well, I've been writing most of my life. I mean, actually, as long as I could, <laughs> when I learned to write, I can put my stories down because I've been creating stories in my mind before I could read or write. And so I remember going into my fifth grade classroom and all of the letters of the alphabet were posted above the bulletin board. And I was so excited thinking I can learn to read so I could write down my story. So I, I've been writing a variety of things. Um, but I fell into, I didn't know I was going to be writing a mystery. I hadn't planned it until after we had mm -hmm. a family tragedy, actually. And that sparked the first book in the Mini in the Bayou County Mystery. And mm -hmm. when I was about halfway through writing Murder in Winnebago County, I started falling in love with my character. So I knew what the next two books were going to be based on actual incidents that happened and they were dramatic things that happened. Mm -hmm. So are, are these actual incidents that you knew about from your own work with the Wright, Wright County Sheriff's Office? Yeah. yeah, the first three books in the series are actual incidents that happened. We took the incident, fictionalized it in the case of the book, which is still a full case. Um, I, I don't like I don't like unsolved crimes, so I, mm -hmm. I I solved I solved the crime in my book, and I always think that someone often aside from the perpetrator that would bring the information forward so that case could be solved. So when you're describing some of these things, I mean, have you actually stood there with the sheriff's department and seen a body in the woods? This one, no, not, no, this one, Death of Linus Wood was actually inspired by a brilliant um, idea. So I belong to Rotary, and we had a speaker that was, had just moved from Utah to Salt Lake City, and she had worked with traffic victim in Salt Lake City, and a large problem there, I understand, which it is all over. And she, we told about this little boy who was about 10 years old. The neighbor had noticed him working in the neighbor's kitchen late at night and she never saw him anywhere else. And so he told her it and he was a little boy that was trafficked for labor. And that was just such a compelling image for me that actually that became a subplot in, in Death and Linus Woods. I just felt, you know, these. Um, these things that need to be brought to light. So, Christine, in addition to what you know from your own personal experiences, how much do you end up doing research, talking to coroners, things like that, for what you're writing? I, I actually, I do a great deal of research. Mm -hmm. For my first book, I didn't need to do as much. 
but for the second book, I probably researched for three months before I actually sat down to write the book because I needed to, um, you know, determine between a psychopath and a sociopath, you know, um, that deals with the dismemberment of a, a person. And it's like, you know, who does that? And so I have to kind of get into my minds and my bad guys too. I, I really feel like you know, to, to tell a story, you need to be in their character. And so the same way with the third book, that is my most telling story actually, and it deals with a, a cult. And so I, I researched about six months before I wrote that book. And it was in response to, I felt I needed to tell the story of, of people that had been mutually abused. And whether mm -hmm. the person was from Australia, I got in the chat lines and Australia or England or, you know, the United States, they all had the, basically the same story. And plus I, the former minister heard that I was writing this book. And so we, he uh, said, you know, I understand you're writing a story. I'd like to talk to you. And so we had a, a nice interview. And I mean, he told me things, of course, I, I couldn't I couldn't put in the book because it was a little bit, people that, don't believe all the, you know, the truth always anyway, and so it was pretty pretty much out there. But yeah, all my all my books, I have all the details because you don't know everything. So my fourth book, you know, involves the crop duster and crops and you know, horseshoe, or not horseshoes, snowshoes, and so it's mm -hmm. amazing how much time each book takes to research. So you know, and and if Somebody is falling in the bottom. You know, that raises, Pardon, yes? that raises a question for me. You know, I know people who are cranking out a book every six weeks. And with the level of research you're talking about, how often are you putting out a book? About once a year? Yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've got another job still. So it's been kind of challenging to be able to get one out. My goal is one per year. But Mm -hmm. That hasn't been realistic the last, I'm finishing my ninth year as a Wright County Commissioner, and so that's very, very demanding, and I need to, of course, give that my full attention also, so mm -hmm. it, that, that is my goal. I actually, with my Snow Globe Got Mysteries, I had that three-book deal with Penguin Random House, so it turned out that three of my books came out the same year in 2015. Wow. <laughs> but, so that was an intense year. Right. I didn't write them all in one year, but with with a large publisher, you know, they you turn it in and then it's a year later before it comes out. So it just turned out that mm -hmm. one came out in January and one in December, but then my death and Linus Woods came out that November. So yeah, it was, it was a <laughs> So that's, that's a lot of books being released fast. I was curious, too, you've got two series, the Winnebago series, and that follows Sergeant Crane Alexson, and then the Snow Globe series, which revolves around a store owner named Cami, I think. Do the, yep. Are they both set in the same town? Do they overlap with the same characters? No, they're completely different stories and completely different, um, not, well, subgenres really because okay. the Globe shot mysteries are more the cozy you know the amateur sleuth that gets in the way of the place so that's been kind of fun to mm -hmm. them too but yeah Cameron Brooks was a um, director of legislative affairs in Washington DC and and got caught up in the scandal so she returns to her hometown of Brooks Land in Minnesota which I have been set in the real Buffalo Minnesota but mm -hmm. like when it was a smaller town and everything was downtown and not, you know, so pretty much um, out on the highways and that kind of thing. Very okay. cool. I, I think we're ready for beer number two. Okay, beer number two <clears throat> is another one of my favorite beers. Uh, this is Hellas Schlenker La Lager. Ah. Um, this is from Brauerei Heller in Bamberg, Germany. Uh, Bamberg, Germany, and this brewery is famous for smoked beers. Uh, the pairing for this is just based on the, the name of the detective, Smoke Dust. 
Um, so that's where I went with that. So this is, uh, their, their most famous beers from this brewery are American style. So like the Indeed beer that we had first, except smoked, or a Bach beer, just smoked. This is their Hellas style lager. So it's much lighter uh, and has a really subtle smoke to it. Um, it's, I've heard, I can't, I don't know that this is true, but I've heard the story that they don't use any smoked malt in this, but the brewery is so smoky that it picks up some smoke flavor. Uh, mm -hmm. I could, I could believe that's true because the smoke is fairly subtle. Uh, but somehow I don't believe that that's true. <laughs> it's, okay. just, it's just the rumor that I've heard, but it's, okay. it's a Hellas lager, so it's malt forward, but has a, a good amount of, of spicy hop and a little bit of bitterness to back that up. And then there's just this lovely kind of woody smoke to it. It, it sounds delicious. And um, so cheers, another one cheers. that... I could have found, so I'm still drinking the last one, but I like the last one, so that's good. Mm -hmm. All right, Christine, go ahead. All right. So this is um, an excerpt from Seeking the White Tail Lake, and this is the sixth book in the Winnebago Tony Mystery Series. So a sergeant has gotten a new side view sonar and wants to try it out on some of the deep lakes in like Winnebago County. So he goes down to Whitetail and he gets an indication that there's something large on the bottom of the lake and falls off the dive scene. So this is when they're on the scene and, and Sergeant Corinne Corky Allison is on the boat. When the car was freed from the lake that held its secret for too many years, we all let out noisy puffs of air. I didn't. I kept my eyes on the old blue and silt filled charger that surfaced, aided by the best equipment available. When most of the vehicle had cleared, water and muck drained out as it was guided onto the bank. My attention was drawn back to Detective Smoke Dawes on the shore in his reaction. He closed his eyes, bent his head, and stroked his forehead with the fingers of one hand. Maybe he was saying a prayer. I had prayed myself throughout the operation. KT, Kyle from KT Towing stopped the winches. Then his partner, Ted, Smoke, and the divers slowly approached the car, knowing it was a coffin holding human remains. They peered in the car windows, dumbstruck. From what I saw in the photos the divers took, the bodies closely resembled ancient, deformed clay statues. They had not decayed in ways, ways we were accustomed to. Let's dock, Sergeant Warren said. He pulled up to shore and signaled Dep Deputy Vince Weber. Warner threw him the rope, and when the boat was secure, we climbed out. My legs were shaky like I'd been on board for days. I wobbled over his smoke side and caught his hand in mine, offering a brief comforting touch. I leaned over, stared into the charger, and had my second involuntary gasp of the morning. It was one thing to see the photos of the victim, it was another to see them in person. Two grotesque looking bodies on the front seat. One was half lying on the other, making it appear like he was shielding her. If the craft hadn't killed them, they must have embraced after the plunge into the lake when they knew they were trapped. I followed Smoke as he began a visual tour of the rest of the vehicle. Smoke? I am 99.9% .9 certain this is Toby Fryer's charger. His face was solemn as he leaned closer to the passenger window and squinted against the sun. I bent over close to smoke so I could talk quietly. Mother is going to freak out if it turns out to be her friends and she'll have good reason for a change. Smoke lifted his eyebrows, no doubt. Think of their families who have wondered all these years. He straightened and so did I. I can't even imagine. Having a loved one disappear, never to be heard from again, was one of the worst things for a person to cope with. I glanced around at Sarah's personnel who were on the scene, and it brought to mind the one who wasn't there. I'm surprised the sheriff hasn't shown up. Cindy has been, hasn't been able to locate him just yet, Smoke said. That didn't seem possible. Really? She called during the towing process to let me know. Truth be told, it got me a little concerned. 
must have a good reason for being wherever he is. As strange as it is, he didn't let anyone know, I said. Smoke's shoulder lifted a couple inches and he went back to his perusal. Other deputies made quiet comments about the car, the bodies, and the possible circumstances. All wondered how in the hell the car had ended up in the lake in the first place without anyone seeing it go in, or at least noticing damage the tire tracks would have caused on the hill and the bank of the lake after it did. The man who had asked Smoke for information earlier walked over. How long has that car been in Whitetail, and how did it get there in the first place? What's your name, sir? I said. Terry Gimler. Mr. Gimler, we don't have that information yet. People are wondering if there are bodies in that car since the deputies keep looking inside like there is, he said. They're doing a visual sweep and then we'll take the car to our crime lab, see if we can get some answers. I've lived here for years and you're telling me all this time there was an old car sitting on the bottom of my lake, he persisted. We'll do our best to figure that out. In the meantime, if you could be so kind to watch from over there. I pointed at the guardrail. It seems like they're ready. Sounds like they're ready to load our car on the flatbed. Gimler's eyes darted back and forth from me to the charger, like he was considering whether or not he could make it to the car for a sneak peek before he was apprehended. Instead, he joined the group that watched from the car. Kyle pushed wheel ramps from the truck bed to the ground and Ted adjusted them. Let's move the side winches back to get them out of the way, he said, and Ted jumped up on the truck to help him. The charger was pulled up from the ramp and onto the truck's bed in no time, leaving behind more muddy water on the way. We watched as a tow truck company prepared to set off on their journey back to the county's evidence garage where the victims would be freed from the Dodge Charger at last. That's a little verb. <laughs> Yeah, I had to remember to unmute there. <laughs> Very intense scene. And of course, the first question is, is this something you have personally witnessed in your life's work, seeing a car pulled out of a lake, seeing dead bodies in a car? I have not. And so what happened is, uh, I, you know, you're kind of when you're writing a series, you think of what the next two or three books are going to be. And I had planned my sixth book to be a hostile action at the nuclear power plant and we have a, a power nuclear power plant in monticello which is about 10 miles from buffalo and then i got elected county commissioner and i got appointed to the nuclear committee and so it's like okay i i uh, I, I can't write anything about any hostile actions at our nuclear power plant. and that was that was just dumb luck that you got appointed to that just as you were I know. Wouldn't, wouldn't you know? <laughs> anyway, so um, my when I was kind of thinking, okay, what am I going to write? What am I going to write? And my brother said, "Did you hear about that couple they found in a car at the bottom of the lake? They figured they'd been down there for about twenty years." And I said, "Well, no, I didn't." Thank you. So it gave me it gave me idea to <laughs> go on, and yeah, and there was you know a, a fair amount of research of course for this too. Well, and one question that arose to me as you were reading this and thinking back to your previous comment that you really dug into kind of the psychology, it raised the question to me, why do you think people are drawn to gather around and watch, you know, a dead body pulled out? Why does this guy want to see the dead body? I mean, it's so true to human nature, but why? Yeah, you're right. I mean, we are very curious creatures. And... I mean, we're, we're, intel we're intelligent people that want to find out answers about pretty much everything. So if you find out, I mean, it's like when you're driving down the freeway and there's a crash and like everyone's turning to look and, you know, you shouldn't be. And, but you all want to know it's just part of our, it's just part of who we are. Some of us are more curious than others, but we all have that, that um, Wonder right about things that we it's, don't know about you know right it just yeah. seems sometimes that human nature is drawn to the darker things like um i i don't think i'd be the one wanting to look in the car and see the dead body and yet i think even i there'd be this little part of me mm -hmm. you know, yeah. what happened um your author page your amazon author page says that your books are character driven and so how would you describe the difference between character driven and plot driven in novels? Well, I think um, you know, the people 
really focus in on characters. And I think that's what keeps them reading. But, you know, it's a real blend too of the plot because the characters are what moves the plot, what drives the plot. I think that dialogue helps with all that. But it's the characters when they are working on working on a crime scene or you know trying to get to the bottom of this when they're doing their investigations and that kind of thing. But there also has to be personal relationships. There has, in my in my opinion, there has to be some, you have to know about how the characters relate to one another, what their, you know, the, if there is there romance going on, what what are the um, you know things that are happening behind the scenes when they're not on these crime scenes. So that's very important. And mm -hmm. I think that adds, that adds to the story. And there, you know, there are some dark things that happen, but there also has to be moments of levity because it can't all be just, you know, depressing stuff. It has to be the um, resolve of, of solving the crime and getting to the bottom of what happened that I think lead and satisfaction. So, and I have one more question on this segment before we have to go to beer number three. And that is a lot of books don't really specify what state or city they're in. You know, they leave it kind of, there is just this story going on. Um, you're very particular that it's in Minnesota. And it brought me back to when my daughter went to college in New York City. We were shocked at the opinions a lot of people had there. Like um, she would have classmates go, oh yeah, you don't have electricity in Minnesota. And she'd say, of course we do. And they'd go, no, you don't. How do you know? Have you been there? No, I just know. Um, wait, wait, you have electricity? <laughs> Don't. I don't. The hamsters are running the wheel working the generator, but I've heard some Minnesotans do have electricity. <laughs> yeah, I noticed you're sitting in the dark there, Michael. Um, you know, people who thought that we all wear red flannel, um, you know, that we all dress like Paul Bunyan. And I kid you not, she had um, somebody else she met on the plane also from Minnesota going to school in New York City. This girl said to her, yeah, after all the comments I've heard about what Minnesota is really like from people who've never been there, she said, I told them we finally got indoor plumbing and my parents are so excited because it's the deluxe version where you can pull the carpet back over the hole in the floor. <laughs> the worst part of it is they totally believed me. Oh. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious, you know, do you have readers far and wide? Do you ever get reactions about like, I didn't think Minnesota was like it seems so normal, <laughs> anything like that. Not, not so much that. They just appreciated, um, you know, the setting and some of the descriptions of where these things take place. And so people that from other parts of the country, they, they just kind of appreciate that. But certainly people in Wright County and in Minnesota, they know exactly where I've set these things, even if I haven't, <laughs> but, but they they know where I'm talking about. And so it's kind of fun to, to be able to relate to that, I think, for people. But, you know, I mean, Minnesotans are really, they're smart people. We have more mystery writers per capita in Minnesota than any other state. We even have a map of where all the mystery writers live. Yeah. And it's, I think that, you know, for one thing, we have a strong sense of justice. We want the bad guy to be a Caught in the jail, and we like to solve puzzles. So as you're following along in a mystery, um, you can, you know, kind of maybe um, solve solve who done it and you know what really happened. So that's part of the part of the. Yeah, we've got these long winter nights. We have nothing to do but solve puzzles and solve mystery. I think we're ready for beer number three. All right, beer number three. Laura, this is your beer. Uh, so you should, you should <laughs> take note of this. One. I know you don't have it in front of you, but you should take note of this one. This is from Boulevard Brewing Company. This is their bourbon barrel quad. So it is that a sounds... Belgian quadruple style ale. 
uh, aged in bourbon barrels. Uh, so the Belgian quadruple style is really strong. So this one is 12 and a half percent, something like that. Um, it's lighter than you would expect because the Belgians use a lot of fully fermentable sugars. So their beers are high alcohol, but not a lot of body. Um, it's loaded with dried fruit. So dried cherries and dates and stuff like flavors like that, all from fermentation with the Belgian yeast strains. Um, and then there's this lovely vanilla and caramel uh, that kind of overlays all of it from the bourbon barrel aging. Uh, and it is delicious. Uh, I paired this one because the thing that mostly, this is another time and place kind of pairing. The thing that really stood out to me in this last reading was all the descriptions of how cold it is. <laughs> and it is a Minnesota winter, uh, which can get really, really cold. Uh, so I, it was easy for me to imagine uh, what, you know, the character, the narrator was describing. So I just wanted a beer that, that's warming. And this, this one is that, the Belgian Quad is a super warming beer, uh, high alcohol, particularly with the bourbon barrel aging added. Uh, it's a beer for curling up by the fire uh, on a cold winter's night. You have me completely sold on this. And no, you would love this beer, Lauren. I'm, I'm going to see when we call around a lot of times, they'll say we can get it for you in a week, um, but not necessarily today. So if I call mm -hmm. around, you know, sooner or later, I will get this and it sounds absolutely wonderful. And that's coming, as you know, from someone who's not a fan of beer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, but you'll like this one totally a lot. Yeah. We are ready for reading number two, Christine. Three. <laughs> Three, sorry. This is an excerpt from Frosty the Dead Man. So this is a third book in the Snow Globe Shop Mysteries. And the first person narrator is Cameron Brooks, who is, the mayor has asked her to stop over to his office to, um, she's, she's wondering if she'd like a seat on the city council. So she's currently working in her parents' Cario Fine shop, which specializes in snow globe from around the world. The cold air bit my cheekbones and nose as I made my way to the city administration building where the mayor and council members had their offices. The police station was housed in the same building and the two departments shared a common front entry then split into separate units. It was warm inside, contrasted with the outside temperature. I slipped off my coat, slung it around my arm and made my way to where the inner offices were located. It was just after 4.30, the official closing time. Lila, the city clerk, strolled in from a back area donned in a hooded lined police coat. She visibly jumped when she saw me. Oh, Cameron, I wasn't expecting anyone this time of day. I was just leaving. Sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. The mayor asked me to stop by. Lila's brown eyes widened and her voice lowered like she was about to share a secret. Mayor Frosch had a revolving door installed back there. People have been coming and going from his office all afternoon. I kind of lost track, but I don't think anyone's in there with him now. Should I go check for you? I'll do that. Thanks, Lila, and enjoy your night. You too, I'm locking up, but the doors have push bars that lock, don't lock from the inside. The hallway and entry lights stay on all night too. The sun was about to set and it would be dark in minutes. Sounds good. She grabbed her purse and left. The near silence in the deserted office space was disquieting. It would be comforting to talk to a live person. I walked down the corridor that led to the individual offices and stopped at the one with the nameplate, Mayor Lewis Frost on it. I knocked and waited, no answer. I knocked again a little louder, but still no answer. He might have left when Lila was away from her post before I'd gotten there. Mayor Frost, I called out and gave the door a final knock. I was about to leave when I noticed light from his office was showing from under the bottom of the door. Maybe he had his earphones on and was listening to music or the news and couldn't hear me. I'd seen him wearing a light system when he was unlocked. After I'd convinced myself Frosty was at his desk, connected to earphones and oblivious to the outside world, I turned the knock, knob and pushed the door open. He'd asked me to stop by after all, but he wasn't at his, at his desk or anywhere else in sight. 
His chair was pushed aside, like he'd gotten up in a hurry and left. I was about to turn tail and leave when I saw what looked like the base of a snow globe the mayor had purchased mere hours before. It was lying on the floor near the desk, but the globe wasn't next to it. What had happened? The snow globe had to hit something hard enough to break it, and the office floor was covered with a soft carpet. I glanced up at the shelves behind the desk. It could have fallen from there and struck the bottom ledge. I crept over to see where the rest of it was. And when I found out the answer, there was no turning back. There were broken pieces of glass and wet snowflakes lying next to Mayor Frost, who was sprawled out on the floor behind his desk. I screamed, but none of the noise I made roused Mayor. He was lying on his back with one arm across his belly and the other stretched out at his side on the floor. His fingers were pointing at the snow globe and the snowy mess, water mess on the floor, the same place his eyes appeared to be staring at. I studied his chest and it was not rising and falling as it should be. Then I squatted down and held my breath as I reached across his shoulder and placed two fingers on his neck in search of a pulse. But no matter how I positioned and repositioned my fingers, I didn't find one. I'm alone with a very dead frosty. I stumbled to my feet and almost toppled back on top of the mayor. I grabbed the edge of the desk for support. That's when I felt something wet and looked at my hand. There's a red substance on my palm and it had a peculiar, familiar odor. Salty, earthy, blood, blood, blood. I braved another look at Frosty and noticed a small brownish spot on the carpet by his face. His injury must be on the side of his head and it was turned toward the floor. I moved as fast as my running challenge body would carry me with my blood-stained palm straight out in front of me, as far from my face and the rest of my body as possible. I needed to find a police officer. And the obvious and best place was at the police station, an office so close and yet so far away. I called out, help, 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 as I ran to the empty and now terrifying building, then pushed out through the door and pulled open the door of the police station. Margaret, a woman who had grown to dislike me more with each passing month, was sitting behind her usual, with her usual stern face behind her desk. She'd been glued to her chair every time I'd been there before, but not this time. When she saw me coming toward her with the bloody hand extended, first she jumped up and then she collapsed across her desk. I prayed she hadn't had a heart attack and died. Assistant Chief Clint Lonsbury would have trouble restraining himself if I brought death to his police station. Margaret, Margaret, please wake up. Tell me you're all right. Help, help. Is anyone back there? Clint, Mark, Jake? Clint appeared from around the corner, then his hand fell on the gun strapped to his side. What in tarnation is going on out here? Wow. <laughs> Nothing I want to experience. So I think that you said that standing is actually based on Buffalo, Minnesota. Yes, I, okay. I, I, Do you... I love Buffalo, Minnesota. I'm sorry, what? I, I said it, it in Buffalo, Minnesota. Yeah. Okay. All at Brook Landing. Which three of my kids actually graduated from Buffalo High School. Oh, they did. Uh, yeah, they did. And in fact, I forget what their names are. Um, one of my sons graduated with the quadruplets, the identical quadruplets who grew right. up in Buffalo, Minnesota. The Durst, the Durst, actually, yeah. Durst. Durst. Right. Yep. Yeah, and that was that was actually really interesting hearing him talk about when the film company came to do a documentary on them and the film company was totally setting everything up like, let's say that you two go on double dates and they're like, oh, we never do. Yeah, but it would be great film, so let's do it, which is a sidetrack. I just that just popped into my head. The point was, I've been in Buffalo, Minnesota a lot. And so I was curious, you know, do you keep your fictional town pretty much identical to the actual Buffalo? And is the curio shop Cami owns based on one of the actual antique or curio shops that they have there? Actually, yeah, I have it set right on Central Avenue. And we had had a shop in that same space a number of years ago. And currently it's Evelyn's Wine Bar. So it's, um, but yeah. When I was, I actually, I'm from Buffalo, I live in Buffalo, and when I was growing up, of course, everything was downtown, you know, you had all the, the drugstore, the free grocery store, the free, um, we had 
gas stations and hardware stores and everything is pretty much downtown. So even though I said it in current time, and I imagine the, the city, that's what I'm imagining. So old buildings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think maybe your readers are aware, I'm assuming that your book, The Downtown, is really only like two or three streets. Yeah, it's a fairly small, you know, yeah, downtown, but most everything is moved out to the, the highways now, the larger, the mm -hmm. larger places. But, you know, it's probably... Right, right. Yeah, from 2,000 people to 60,000 people <laughs> in 50 years. Yeah, it's it's not big. It's and it's I, I love Buffalo. It's a great town. So to me, writing mysteries seems like one of the hardest things to do because you have to layer in these clues. You have to kind of sparse them out. You have to give enough for the reader to have a fighting chance to figure it out, but not too much that they're like, duh, you know, um, and given that you as the author know the truth going in, how do you know because you already know everything, how do you know that you've pieced these clues out and given enough, but not too much? Yeah, that's always, you know, sort of a fine dance. So I'll, when I'm, I'm not an outliner, but I imagine the story in my in my head. I, I know my beginning, I know my end, I know my bad guy. Um, so some people that don't plot don't always know their bad guy. I always know that. So I'm working toward the end and I know I need, you know, certain key plot points along the way, but sometimes I'm writing and I go down just a little, you know, different, take a little different path. Well, then I go back and insert the clue earlier. So um, I do some of that. So I do more note taking as I'm writing or as I've gotten, um, you know, a number of chapters written and then I'll go in and say chapter one, this happens, chapter two. So I kind of do, I don't know if you want to call it a reverse outline or what, but yeah, it, it needs to, when reading through, you know, do I, have I given enough information or too much information? So do you have creative readers who go through and kind of let you know how, how it came across to them if it was too much or not enough? I, I do. I, yeah, I've got actually like eight or so that like to beta proofread for me. And so I always, you know, take any feedback. And one of my main things is, is there anything that makes you stop and have to reread? Because I never, I never want my readers, and of course it just kind of happens anyway. Sometimes you're caught up in something when you're reading and you want to reread, but I, I don't want someone to stop because they don't understand what that sentence is or what it's about. So that really helps me to, if they'll, you know, could kind of circle something and say, you know, to stop me. So, or question mark, but yeah. Right, right. And do you feel like, did you read books on how to write mysteries or did this come fairly naturally to you? I, you know, I read a lot of mysteries um, and so it does. I guess come fairly naturally, and you know when you have when you have um, your basic crime, and so that sort of that kind of helps tell the story. And I mean, each book to me writes itself differently because there are different bad guys in the stories, and you have the continuing characters, and yet you know their relationships are ebbing and flowing, and different things happen to them. You know they have critical incidents and you know just about about every book you know critical incidents right. and right. so things so, change them and shape them um so, so after writing I, I believe you have nine books that are all either in the winnebago county or the snow globe series do you foresee yourself starting a third series or will you continue in these two yeah, I, my actually, um, I've got right now. I've got eleven books in print, but my ninth Winnebago County mystery will be out in November, and people have been asking me for that fourth snow globe. And so my, um, you know, with Penguin Random House, I had that three book deal, and then actually about a year before my third book came out, they sold their Berkeley imprints to Putnam, Putnam and Dutton, and it became Putnam. If I can even say it fast, but Putnam, Dutton, and Berkeley, and they went from like 38 titles 
a month to like five and I was not one of the you know ones that went on um but I my agent said you know I mean publishers don't want to pick up a book mid-series so you can you can self-publish you can get it out yourself and so that's just been the the kind of stopping point a little bit is just the time the time to to write another one when I'm you know doing a Winnebago but I am writing the fourth snow globe it's just, it didn't get done as quickly as I hoped so. that's great and we are out of time again and so it's time to give our links uh where can people find you online Christine so my um, website is christinehewson.com and that's pretty easy but Anyone can also email me anytime at christinehewson at aol.com and I'd be happy to answer any questions and um, it, try to update my website, you know, as much as I can and anybody wants to sign up for a newsletter, I send one out like every other month. Basically, it's just updates of where I'm going to be and, you know, what I'm up to. So, thanks for asking. And um, just so... I'm unmuted. My computer's telling me I'm muted. Um, so people know that Husum is H-U-S-O-M. Sometimes people are unsure how to spell things. I'm at lauravosika.com, V as in Victor, O-S-I-K-A. You can also get there through bluebellschronicles.com. I'm at Instagram, but I never do anything, so there's no point telling you where I am there. Um, it's Laura like underscore Vosika, I think. Michael, where are you and where are we? I am at aperfectpint.net and aperfectpint on the socials that I don't do anything with. Um, <laughs> we are at booksandbrews.net or book and brews on Instagram, which I don't do anything with. And <laughs> at, uh, books and brews with Laura Vosika and Michael Agnew on Facebook. Um, any upcoming okay. events? I, of course, have none. Nothing for you, Christine? Right, well, I've got a, a book club I'm going to tomorrow night and also one next week and to be on um, Give an Author Talk in Potato next month. And also, um, yeah, I, I did Oktoberfest oh. in Delano last Saturday. I had my books there, so that was oh. a great event. Yeah. Well, cool. they had some good beer there too, Michael. <laughs> All right. And uh, Laura, who do, we have next, who do we have next month? Well, you, you didn't give me a chance to tell my exciting event. Oh, I'm sorry. You have a bit. <laughs> well, I mean, it's the same event I always have, which is that Gabriel Horn is accepting submissions for Poems on Love. And you can find that at gabrielshornpress.com slash poetry dash anthology. And the link and there's a link to that on the uh, Books and Brews podcast <laughs> website. Yes, it will be there. Um, well, now, so coming next, we have next month. <laughs> Ta -da. Um, we actually have a last minute fill in because our planned guest had mm -hmm. a, a family come up and I'm excited about this which I know I say every month but it's always true um Sandy Hanna and Sandy Hanna is a brat which means a British regiment attached transfer and so most people in America I think know that military kids are called military brats and that's actually what it stands for she is the daughter of a military officer the colonel she and her siblings are part of a feral tribe known as Saigon Kids, that is, kids who lived in Vietnam from 1960 to 1962, as children whose parents were part of the military, CIA, USA, aid, State Department, and private contractors. Sandy Hanna is an educator and designer of experiential play environments for children, including the Sesame Place theme park, Head Start indoor play spaces, and several children's museums. Her educational background is in child development and the biology of cognition, how we know what we know. She lives with her photographer husband in New York City and New Jersey, and her book is called, I believe it's Tea with My Father. It is about her life with her 90-year-old uh, colonel, military officer father. So I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. That sounds fun. I like her job. <laughs> I do, too. Literally. Uh, this yeah. has been so, uh, this has been books and brews 
podcast episode 30. Uh, Christine, thank you for joining us and chatting. This has been most interesting. Um, thank we you, look Christine. forward to uh, next month and thank you all out there for tuning in. Cheers. Bye.